You've certainly missed a bit. Tensions between Iran and the United States have escalated tenfold due to a Trump-ordered airstrike on an airport in Baghdad. The two missiles fired by a U.S. drone caused the dust to settle with 24 people dead, one of them being a critical blow to Iran, the death of their top military general, the head of Iran's elite Quds force. This has led to an explosion of anger throughout Iran, with Iran's supreme leader warning that a harsh retaliation is waiting for the United States. This was showcased in the form of a riot, with Iraqi military supporters breaking the U.S. Embassy compound in Baghdad, smashing the main door, and setting the building ablaze. Since U.S. embassies are used for American affairs in foreign countries, as well as to preserve and protect the relationship between the host country and the United States, this can be seen to many as Iran's direct attack on the United States, with Articles 21 to 25 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations implying that U.S. embassies are U.S. territory, stating that they should be undisturbed and protected to avoid conflict. It's certainly looking like war could be the possible, if not inevitable, conclusion, with more troops being sent to Iran and countermeasures on both sides gearing up. So the question now on everyone's mind is, will this be World War III? Well, the answer is not so simple as yes or no, as for warfare to be considered a world war, multiple countries must be involved, and the United States' biggest threat is not Iran, but more so Russia. Iran and Russia have a military alliance, and Russia outnumbers the US in nuclear warheads, but Putin and Trump have shown a great relationship, so I highly doubt that'll lead to Cold War II electric boogaloo. So with that out of the way, let's have a look at how a war between Iran and the United States would go down. Here are a couple of Iran's options. Nuclear warfare is most likely never going to happen due to a variety of certain factors. The US has a way bigger nuclear stockpile due to having, oh I don't know, a 50 year head start, and the biggest world powers have nuclear countermeasures in place should an attack on them go down. The US's capability to launch nukes anywhere in the world surpasses pretty much every other country except Russia of course due to unofficial satellite states as well as the Navy. So the nuclear warfare option is pretty much completely out of the picture. Conventional warfare is the standard option, though they have very little chance of winning at all. Iran, though powerful in its own right, is not even in the top 10 strongest countries in the world. Only two other countries could possibly stand a chance in a prolonged fight with the United States, and those countries are the top two and three, China and Russia. Iran's military assets mostly consist of imported arms or hand-me-down foreign technology from the late 90s, retrofitted with newer technology. Iran's military budget is $20 billion. Yes, $20 billion. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that $20 billion isn't a lot of money, but when your rival country's space exploration program, which has gone down significantly in budget since the space race, actually gets more money than your military every single year, I'm not so sure you'd stand the biggest of chances in a war against said power. Oh, and that's not mentioning the United States' $600 billion that goes into those really nice F-35As. Yeah, it's just not gonna happen. Modern conventional warfare relies heavily on logistics and air superiority, and with the US's large air force and naval fleets patrolling international seas, it's easy to provide air support in combat, so Iran has very little chance here. Iran could potentially use guerrilla tactics in order to delay and prolong their conflict in hopes of achieving an outcome that's a bit more in their favor. Here's the problem. The US has learned much from its only loss in a war, <coughs> I mean, armed conflict with Vietnam. They will most likely resort to other methods such as more surgical strikes and carpet bombing. The final option for Iran would possibly be to stage another attack on U.S. soil. However, this is not the smartest decision, as it will throw massive political support for the United States military, and it'll pretty much devolve until one side is completely starved of resources, and I can tell you firsthand, it will not be the United States. So that's a few options on how Iran could theoretically topple the US. And to be honest, I'm not that far from the nation's capital, so absolutely no worries in my head at all of Iran just coming through and dropping a nuke. Yep, I'm completely and totally calm. But if you guys did enjoy this video, please be sure to leave a...
out hero. Cries drowned out by angry chants. Soleimani, a beloved figure in Iran, seen as standing up to the West. Now, his death and the way it was carried out, a game changer for Iran and the United States. President, we don't have any right to kill him. My colleague, Martha Raditz, one of the few Western journalists allowed in the country. This procession so packed you can barely move, but the emotion is everywhere. People have a very strong message for America. They're chanting, death to America. Inside the funeral service, tears from Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini weeping and praying over Soleimani's grave. There are few figures who held, were held in higher esteem by the Iranian people than Mr. Soleimani. He was the man who brought back pride. On the ground, his image everywhere. More than a million united in their cry for revenge. Revenge must happen, and it is certain. What kind of revenge do you want? Uh, anything. 24-year-old Hussein is a college student. What is your message to America? I'm saying we love Americans, but we don't have presidents. Soleimani, a critic of the United States, taunted across the region. Members of the Iranian parliament chanting death to America. And this weekend, an ominous sign, a red flag symbolizing war raised above an Iranian mosque. We took action last night to stop a war. We did not take action to start a war. In the face of criticism, President Trump insisted the attack was a necessary measure. Soleimani was plotting imminent and sinister attacks on American diplomats and military personnel, but we caught him in the act and terminated him. But there are questions about the administration's initial justification for the attack, just how imminent those threats were. This evening, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff telling reporters the intelligence was compelling, adding... Did it exactly say who, what, when, where? No. But he was planning, coordinating, and synchronizing significant combat operations against U.S. military forces in the region, and it was imminent. But the Iranians deny those claims, instead pointing to the general's record of fighting ISIS. Iranian officials threatening retaliation that would target U.S. military in the region. Whether they punch back is a big calculus because they know that if they do, they're going to be hit hard with conventional attacks on Iranian soil. And those attacks could bring down a very fragile economy. Over the weekend, President Trump warned that if there is retaliation, he has 52 Iranian targets in his sights. And it will be a target designed at the singular mission, protecting and defending America. Trump contradicted that notion hours later, telling reporters off camera that Iranians are allowed to kill our people, they're allowed to torture and maim our people, and we're not allowed to touch their cultural sites. It doesn't work that way. Tensions in Iran impacting relations with neighboring Iraq. The Iraqi parliament, angry at the killing of prompted Trump to threaten Iraq with sanctions and demand repayment for the billions of U.S. dollars spent in the country. Amidst this crisis, the U.S. and NATO pausing operations against ISIS. It's worth noting, the last time there was a power vacuum in Iraq, ISIS filled the void. This latest round of escalations began in 2018 after President Trump dismantled the Iran nuclear deal brokered by President Obama. This was a horrible one-sided deal. Today, the Iranian government announcing they're suspending commitments to that deal now abandoning limits on enriching uranium and stockpiling nuclear fuel. Hostilities continue to escalate after a series of Iranian provocations over this past summer, including the downing of an American drone. Then, in late December, an American contractor was killed in a rocket attack in Iraq. The U.S. blamed an Iranian-backed militia and responded with airstrikes that killed at least two dozen people, possibly including civilians. 
On New Year's Eve, a huge crowd of protesters stormed the U.S. Embassy compound in Baghdad, breaching the highly fortified perimeter. A two-day siege sent diplomats into a safe room and forced Marines to deploy tear gas. President Trump blamed Iran for orchestrating those protests, ominously tweeting two days before General Soleimani was killed, Iran is going to pay a very big price. This is not a warning, it is a threat. America's contentious history with Iran goes back decades, back to 1953, when the U.S. installed the Shah in order to protect oil interests. After 25 years, in 1979, mass demonstrations filled the streets and forced the Shah into exile. Then, just months later... The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. ...holding dozens of American hostages for 444 days before they were released in 1981. The relationship between the U.S. and Iran over the next few decades would remain fractured. Fast forward to 2013. President Barack Obama's administration started taking small but controversial steps to bridge...